Vitalik. Bitte. A special guest on stage. On side, Please Chef. join us and welcome Vitalik. Okay, yeah, well, first of all, Vitalik, thank you so much for being here. I think I speak for all of us here in the room um, when I say that, yeah, it's super awesome to have you. Um, Berlin is always very excited to have you, and it's probably a very special moment for many people here who hacked all night through. So welcome. Thank you very much, it's, uh, and it's so good to be back in Berlin. Yeah. Talking about Berlin, that is a very good first point. Um, we want to use this interview to basically uh, touch on yeah, topics of our manifesto, but also, since we're in Berlin, walking down uh, the memory line a little bit and yeah, talk about stuff from the past which uh, you may have fond memories of uh, or not, let's see. <laughs> but my first question would be, um, what are your favorite Ethereum moments that happened in Berlin? And do you have any personal connection to the city? I mean, I've, I feel like I've uh, been here like many, many times over the, la uh, over the last, um, I guess, 10 years now, I think. Uh, things that I still remember well is definitely yeah, myself, uh, Gavin, uh, Gavin and uh, Jeff uh, hacker housing together in our old office in uh, 37 Waldemarstrasse and uh, ha uh, coding up uh, POC9, uh, which would then uh, you know, like end up uh, being the Olympic test net and uh, like just working together over the course of two or three days and like fixing uh, all of the bugs uh, before I had to head off to Switzerland and they yeah, all had to head back to where they are. Um, I, th I yeah, definitely still remember that, still remember the yeah, Ethereum launch uh, here, of course. The, yeah, then. Uh, you know, I was also here for the uh, Ethereum uh, merge uh, as well. I, uh, I mean, I was unfortunately, yeah, uh, I, I, I was uh, sick that day and I didn't want to infect people, and so I kind of waved at the uh, ETH dev office from outside. But uh, you know, it was still uh, lovely to you know, like be here as well. No, I mean, it's uh, there have just been you know a series of. Uh, just a really yeah, amazing, I mean, Ethereum events, but also just uh, Ethereum communities and um, you know, Ethereum people that have uh, been here for a long time. This is uh, you know, one of the, yeah, one of the um, places where the Ethereum Foundation has, uh, the mo has the most people and has uh, had the most people for a long time, and I'm always uh, really grateful every time I come back. Cool. Yeah, and uh, in case you guys didn't know, Berlin is also the place where DEF CON Zero happened, so the very first mm. DEF CON in history. Um, what do you remember about that? Mm. I mean, it happened, uh, you know, again in... Uh, I, 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 I try, it just gets like, okay, uh, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll try anyway. Um, it, I think, yeah, uh, I mean, it was still, I mean, like at the in that same office uh, where we yeah, later ended up coding POC9 and uh, launching uh, Ethereum from you know this uh, fourth floor of a fairly unassuming building, and uh, there were only about like 45 people there. Um, so you know, first uh, DevCon was the smallest DevCon, and um, you know, like everyone just. Uh, properly came together for the first time. Um, you know, people presented CPP Ethereum, Go Ethereum, all of the different projects from the research team. Um, you know, Jill Lubin, uh, who uh, uh, eventually yeah, moved on to start Consensus, uh, was there the whole time. Um, so it was just like a really nice uh, you know, like opportunity for all of the people who are building Ethereum right at the beginning to um, actually yeah, just get together and, and uh, see each other and share ideas. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. crazy to think about like mm -hmm. 40 people at DEF CON uh, here in mm -hmm. DEF CON Zero and now I want to say 7,000 in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So the, the space has grown quite a bit and you mentioned that uh, yeah, the community is very important. I want to say that Berlin has a quite strong um, crypto and Ethereum focused community. Uh, what would you say, which role or what role does the community play for Ethereum? So one of the things that I notice about Berlin, and I think this uh, stretches um, out even beyond Ethereum, is like the city definitely has this like really strong and deep political culture. 
Like people really care about values here in uh, a way yeah, that's like greater than uh, a lot of other cities. And uh, like I don't even look at, look at this for uh, like not even just in Ethereum. Like if you just uh, look at all of the different ads on the street, I even uh, made a point of just uh, photoing them because there's like so many of them right now. Um, you know, people talking about uh, you know being a, a strong together with uh, Europe. I'm um, you know, freedom. Uh, a lot of, um, people That's because we have the elections coming course, up, yeah. A lot of people supporting uh, supporting Palestine, which uh, of course uh, makes sense. Um, this one is, uh, uh, th there's like really fun ones. There's this uh, one, uh, 180 Grad Ziel nicht überschreiten. So do not step over the goal of 180 degrees. And you have like a, a pizza that looks like the earth. So it's like a you know, pretty fun joke about climate change. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. It's, uh, you know, like, pe like people care and uh, like it's clearly genuine and, um, you know, at the same time as uh, caring, people are actually willing to have fun. That's, I mean, well, even the world coin ads are fun here. <laughs> <laughs> they do have their ads up everywhere, that's true. So that's, you know, yeah, right, so it's, uh, and, and, and this is just like things that I see just like walking around here over the course of uh, the last few days and it's like a pattern that I've seen over uh, over and over again, right? And uh, I think uh, very similar ideals get uh, reflected in the uh, Ethereum culture here, right? It's, uh, you know, the, this has uh, never been the, uh, the center of uh, going into Ethereum to make money. Um, this has, uh, you know, never been the, uh, you know, the center of uh, getting into Ethereum in order to try to dominate the world or, um, you know, like launch your own token uh, for the sake of launching a token or, you know, like any of those things. I, like, there's been uh, a very deep um, open source culture here. And uh, I mean, I even remember Gavin, one of our co-founders, uh, he, uh, the perspective that he brought um, to Ethereum and uh, like the perspective that I think a lot of the developers that he found, um, you know, here and uh, also uh, brought is basically yeah, looking at Ethereum, not just as being like Bitcoin plus smart contracts, but looking at it as being open source programs that can have a memory, right? And uh, like that's uh, it's a really fascinating shift in perspective. And like if you really think about it, like it's a really valuable run, right? Because uh, like I think we can all kind of understand the story here, right? That uh, if you you know how was the original you know free software movement born? Um, you know at the beginning all software was free because like hey yeah you know you write something and it's really cool and you should share it. And then people like Bill Gates um, you know started making it proprietary and putting it behind copyrights and uh, even trying to put it behind patents. And then people like Richard Stallman got upset and they said, like, no, um, you know, you should be able to do things on your computer with uh, software. And, uh, you know, if you're working with tools, you should be able to, like, pick apart those tools and, like, change them and make them what you want and, like, see what's going on inside and, uh, like, redistribute them and make your own things on top, right? And uh, then that vision, like, you know, we say open source succeeded, but then at the same time, what happened was that there was this shift from like mostly local computing to like mostly computing on uh, like, uh, you know, first we had Microsoft Word, then, okay, you know, we had OpenOffice, which became LibreOffice, and, uh, you know, that's better than Microsoft Word because it's uh, open. But then you have Google Docs, and Google Docs is, like, way less open than, like, even Microsoft Word was. Like, with Microsoft Word, at least it creates files that are on your computer. There isn't, like, a national intelligence agency that sees them automatically. Um, you know, you can even, um, you know, like, go uh, and uh, try to reverse engineer how the files work, and like you know, open office actually managed to do that and like you know how does google docs work it's like okay you know everything goes off into a cloud and like you know like servers like somewhere in america and like i'm not even sure where right and uh, the reason why it has to be this way is because people start started caring about collaboration right and people started caring about um, you know things like not just like me editing a document for myself but like people working together on a uh, documents right and the and then you ask like 
how do you translate the ideals of free software onto a world where like we software just has to be networked in order to fulfill people's needs, right? And so the vision is basically like, okay, you have to have a shared memory and like maybe Ethereum can be that shared memory, right? So like that was the, web, the original Web3 vision. And of course, I think, uh, you know, the original Ethereum ended up uh, not uh, delivering back then, uh, basically because, uh, you know, there were the three pieces, Ethereum, Whisper, and Swarm. And uh, on Ethereum, the fees were too high. Um, you know, you're nobody, you know, who here wants to use uh, a version of, uh, um, you know, Google Docs that is free and open TM, but every time you make an edit, you have to pay a dollar and 33 cents. <laughs> okay, so like, and then, you know, we had Whisper and uh, Swarm, but those uh, ended up, uh, you know, t taking uh, oh, no, a really long time to get developed. And then, I mean, I, but then since then, of course, I mean, you know, we've actually had some progress on this, right? You know, we've actually, yeah, Ethereum is cheap again, thanks to layer twos. Blobs are actually succeeding. Um, you know, then uh, Whisper, I mean, it uh, ended up turning into Waku and like Waku is like actually out there. Like I think, uh, I think Railgun actually uses it under the hood, I believe. Um, so it's, uh, and then, you know, we have IPFS and like the pieces are actually coming together, right? So like there is a vision where now that the technology is actually there, there's like these piece, these uh, older ideas and pieces that I think we can, you know, remine and uh, revisit. But like the culture, um, you know, here is like one that like actually really uh, values those things. And um, I think uh, like I've always been, um, you know, grateful to especially, especially the Berlin part of our community for just like keeping those aspects and those ideas inside of Ethereum alive. Speaking about values, Vitalik, um, mm. in um, around 2017, 2018, I remember when the mm. Parity Multisig was hacked, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of initiatives going on trying mm -hmm. to like solve this, you know, like trying mm -hmm. to figure out the governance, how to solve like non-technical problems. Mm. And um, we all were kind of t distracted, you know, we got together in, in Toronto for EIP0, mm -hmm. and we all were kind of trying to figure out how to solve these problems, but then at some point on the side, just as a side product, we realized we had all we coming from different backgrounds, from different geographic locations, mm -hmm. and we all um, don't necessarily have the same understanding what Ethereum is or what Ethereum values are. What, mm. what, in your opinion, are Ethereum values? Mm. I mean, I think there is a yeah, core that strongly motivates people, and uh, like one of the yeah, sen sentences that I yeah, sometimes use is like trying to build uh, a free yeah, and open internet that is uh, at the same time trustworthy. And uh, I think uh, like that cap captures a big chunk of what makes blockchains unique compared to both centralized systems, um, but and um, also a lot of other projects that are trying to be decentralized, but that uh, are not um, you know, like using things like blockchains and zero knowledge proofs, for example. So I think uh, you know, there is a, a yeah, solid core um, around that. Um, and, but uh, at the same time, like there's a lot of different um, you know, groups that have have a lot of different emphases, right? And uh, you know, we have people here that are working on community currencies. Um, we uh, have people elsewhere that are working on uh, a very different type of uh, decentralized financial markets. There's uh, you know people um, like uh, Gitcoin who um, you know like have their own view of uh, you know, like what it means for the crypto space to support the commons. Um, then you know we have uh, other groups. I mean even uh, you know like groups like uh, you know like circles and breadchain for example that I mean like you know like have some of their own takes of uh, what things like that might mean. So I think. Uh, there's definitely yeah, like some level of alignment, but at the same time, there are all of these uh, different uh, offshoots uh, that have somewhat uh, d somewhat different approaches, and I actually think that's healthy, right? I think uh, one of uh, Ethereum's strengths as a community, right, is something that like we sometimes get criticized for a lot, which is like, oh, you know, Bitcoin has a simple narrative; it's digital gold, and like that kind of like papers over the fact that like actually, you know, there was like, you know, digital gold and uh, the yeah, uh, like internet cash thing and digital gold ended up winning. But like, you know, digital gold is like this one dominant thing and that's it. But like in Ethereum, it's like, whoa, like what the heck is Ethereum? And, uh, you know, okay, you know, like, sorry, you know, Ethereum is uh, less BlackRock friendly than some people would like. But uh, at the same time, like, I think it's uh, like, it. Uh, 
it really, yeah, the strength is basically that, like, we are able to, like, actually, yeah, you know, like, massively paralyze and, uh, like, at the same time, like, actually, yeah, you know, like, deliver on, like, the, the best version of uh, a bunch of uh, these different approaches that we can. And, uh, like, in, in that process, I mean, sometimes, um, you know, we discover, like, what, what things actually work better, what makes sense to do, what doesn't make sense to do, and, you know, like, what kinds of uh, ideas it makes sense to combine together and what ideas to rally around, and, like, I think that's a good thing. Um, at East Berlin, we um, always hmm. try to hmm. um, emphasize a lot on values, and we try hmm. also to make our part to define these values, and hmm. what we usually do is we try to open the door a bit for our hackers to mm -hmm. um, to learn more about these values by writing our manifesto. You know, we write, write a manifesto where we reference local or global trends and polit political events, uh, but also reference uh, maybe what's going on in the crypto scene. And just about when we were uh, about to uh, publish it, this earlier this year, you you published uh, your own blog post, uh, "Make Ethereum Cyberpunk Again," mm. which uh, caught us a little bit off guard. Um, mm. what, what is it about, and what what prompted you to write this? I'm curious. Mm. I think I mean one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last couple of years is basically kind of going back to this big question of like, how do we actually make uh, if like all of the work that we're doing inside of Ethereum relevant in the context of a world that's uh, changing very quickly, where you know you have uh, other kinds of technologies that are advancing quickly. Yeah, you know, world politics is changing quickly. AI is um, happening. Um, you have uh, all of these uh, different things happening, and uh, you know, at the same time, there's. Uh, you know, in Ethereum, always this uh, big uh, challenge, right, where a lot of people just, uh, like, often lo do lack this kind of understanding of, like, what even is uh, a thing that uh, it makes sense for the uh, Ethereum ecosystem to be building for. And, like, I felt that there was uh, a lack of uh, just uh, a simple post that, like, tries to articulate, I mean, like, what is a vision that I think uh, really yeah, makes sense to strive toward and that at the same time is like really yeah, updated for all of the things that have happened uh, you know, like socially and, uh, t and technologically over the last 10 years. Right, so one of the things that I yeah, did in the post is like I have that uh, big, uh, you know, like two column table, right, where I talk about like, you know, 2010's Ethereum and uh, 2020's Ethereum. And one of the yeah, big uh, kind of updates that I tried to like really push there is like, hey guys, zero knowledge proofs are like actually incredibly game changing, right? And like I've said before, like I consider zero knowledge proofs to be as important as blockchains, right? And I think. Uh, the reason why I say this is basically because um, you know we talk about uh, like what we do as being a trust technology, but then if you ask the question of like what are trust problems that people actually have, a lot of the time the trust problem isn't like you know hey yeah, are these people going to edit the database in the wrong way? The trust problem is like hey, you know are they going to you know like spy on me? Are they going to just like grab all of this data and like you know train on it or you know use it against me in some way and uh, like zero knowledge proofs do actually yeah, I mean, like solve this whole other set of uh, trust problems. And at the same time, they basically compensate for blockchain's two biggest weaknesses, right? Like blockchains give you an open global audit trail, they give you permissionlessness, they give you censorship resistance, they give you really important things at the cost of two very big things. One is privacy, one is scalability. What are the two things that ZK Snarks give you? They give you privacy and they give you scalability. Um, so, but then, Oh, so that's like one of the piece from the technology side, but then there's also a piece from the yeah, application side, right? And uh, if you look at the yeah, original Ethereum white paper, um, you know, it had a lot of these different uh, suggestions for like things that people could do. Like, hey, you know, you can build a DAO, you know, you can build a, yeah, a, a token swap, um, you know, you can build a, a prediction market, you can build an insurance system, right? You can build a stable coin. And uh, people did end up building um, quite a few of those things, but uh, at the same time, like it felt like, uh, yeah, the, like I felt a need for some kind, like an update to that, in the sense of like you know here is a uh, coherent 
thing that the that the ecosystem as a whole could uh, really uh, be working towards and like what does it even mean to to have all of the different pieces that people are working on really yeah, try to actually fit together right and uh, you know basically yeah, you know the core um, point that I tried to make is like we actually do have the tools today to like build out this uh, entire tech stack that basically yeah, competes with traditional centralized tech at every level right so you know we have um, we have money we have DeFi we yeah, increasingly have identity yeah, and um, like attestation related primitives so we have uh, some uh, pretty good governance technology um, you know we uh, we have a domain name system we uh, have some protocols that are the beginnings of some kind of uh, some kind of encrypted messaging we have uh, tools that we can add on top to try to make the uh, to try to solve the problem of uh, you know for example if you're using an encrypted messenger, how do you actually trust the uh, the key of the person you're talking to? And uh, you know, we actually have all of these pieces, and there is like this extra you know, like value that comes like where when you actually try to put these pieces together, and like there is a yeah, coherent thing that you can make where the sum really becomes much greater than the parts, and the possibility of uh, like actually yeah, working toward and making that is uh, something that I thought is. Uh, like there would be a lot of value in making clear and just like point out that you know this is something possible and uh, this uh, is something where there is uh, a lot of value in uh, tr in trying to build toward it and uh, you know, like I think uh, these are also things where um, you know you don't need to like personally uh, you know like understands the details of uh, you know like polynomial math and uh, arithmetization to kind of you know see the value of the package and it's uh, like and I feel like I've talked about the different parts of the package in different contexts but it's like uniquely uh, valuable to like actually just uh, like talk about that package as a package and uh, like talk about what, what that package is and what it does and uh, you know and what value it provides and uh, like hopefully yeah, you know, we actually yeah, are going to continue to make progress and like actually yeah, you know keep uh, build, building out more parts of it over the next year or two yeah so um, Afri touched on this already. Our topic this year is identity crisis, mm -hmm. and it was basically a two-fold theme. Mm -hmm. We had the high-level identity crisis in terms of Ethereum values, back to the roots, what do we actually want to achieve here, mm -hmm. but also really tangibly, um, mm -hmm. what do we do with identities in the blockchain space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think we can figure out decentralized identities uh, in the blockchain space mm -hmm. without feeding governments, uh, or corporates, or mm. other evil entities with our precious data. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's really good that you're, you know we're having the conversation. I think uh, you know we've been kind of overdue for uh, a rethink on the yeah, identity topic for a while, and I think the reason is that like 10 to 20 years ago, the mentality is basically that uh, you know freedom comes from the fact that on the internet nobody knows you're a dog, and there's like you know like totally zero, um, you know like nimity of uh, any kind, and uh, the closer you get to that ideal, the Better. But then uh, the challenge in the 2020s is basically that uh, if you're a yeah, completely yeah, like unattested, anon, and uh, like there's no other information about you except for your content, then you're indistinguishable from like tens of millions of bots that might all be controlled by the same corporation or government, right? And uh, so it's not just like a simple sort of like tug where you know the bad guys want like more name name things and we want fewer name things. It's like actually a pretty yeah, challenging battle, and uh, it's uh, like it's not like the challenge isn't just in you know opposing and opposing hard enough. The challenge is in like actually yeah, figuring out like what is the yeah, the positive direction that we're trying to move towards, and. Uh, I th the way that uh, I, I think about this is that uh, you know, like having ID some kind of identity primitives and reputation primitives is a uh, a very valuable thing, and it's like something you have to have because you have to somehow distinguish yourself from 10 million bots that are all controlled by the same company. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, we do not want this. Uh, Thing to you know become a vector of power that can be yeah, used over um, against all of us, 
And so one of the ways that I think about this is like, having zero metrics is really bad because then you can't distinguish yourself from the bots. Having one metric is really bad because then that one metric becomes the social credit score. And um, you know, like whoever controls the rules of that uh, basically yeah, controls everything. And the least bad solution seems to be to go in the other direction and say like, we, yeah, you know, we need to have many metrics, right? And um, you know, there, is, yeah, like there should, should not be one single kind of master system that basically says, uh, you know, are you a yeah, trustworthy human or are you not, right? And, uh, like the system needs to naturally yeah, incorporate a lot of different metrics um, in such a way that it even uh, accepts disagreements from uh, di between different people about like which uh, which of those metrics are worth focusing on, right? And creating that ecosystem, I think, is something that Ethereum has kind of started to do implicitly, right? Like we've started to have popes, we've uh, started to have, uh, you know, the ver various kinds of attestations. We have the Ethereum attestation service. We've been starting to, you know, like have zoo stamps and um, you know, like various uh, zk-related things, and like it feels like we're at the beginning of uh, something that. You know, like that that feels like it's uh, going somewhere but like at the same time we definitely need to like really be yeah, vigilant and see like you know what is it that this uh, thing is actually going towards and I mean that's like one answer that I have to how to do that is to like actually think about concrete issues right uh, because uh, you know when you're writing code you have unit tests and like I think uh, one of the best ways to sanity check a political ideology or a uh, political movement or project is to do unit tests right it's uh, like uh, you know like 10 or 20 years ago I um, you know like, well, I think uh, a lot of people here were on like internet libertarian forums and like you know you discuss things like oh you know if you're flying a, yeah, a helicopter, you know, drunk without a license, like maybe there's a threshold at which you're imposing enough risk on other innocent people that that actually counts as aggression, right? And like this gets into these like philosophical debates, but then like the specific example like actually shows, I um, mean, you know, like the limits of uh, you know, like applying a particular principle, right? And so here, I um, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's like actually great that we uh, have people talking about specific examples and um, you know, including the, being willing to talk about specific uh, examples that are political because um, you know, I think uh, I mean, you're never going to get um, like perfect agreements among all of them because um, you know, we're all different and um, you know, we all have uh, various uh, different ideas and different backgrounds, but uh, like it actually does help you uh, see yeah, you know, like on the whole, is this uh, thing that's being built something that uh, is already uh, moving towards uh, outcomes that are good for the kinds of causes that we care about helping? And uh, like having that kind of tight feedback loop is uh, something that uh, I think is good. And I think in general, like it's uh, it's really good that uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is like starting to actually have this focus on real world applications. It's something that we really need to have. And uh, I think it's like, it's okay that we're making that switch only now because uh, if you tried to make an application three years ago, like the reality is that the technology was not there, right? Like, uh, you know, we've been virtue signaling about helping people in Latin America and um, Africa and, and, and so on. But like the reality is that, uh, you know, I went to, Argentina for the first time at the end of 2021. I tried to pay for a coffee, and um, you know the coffee like and people there were all you know using Binance and uh, Binance to Binance transfers are free and they're instant and like it actually works for them. I tried to you know be a proper crypto person and use the blockchain. And my yeah, transaction took like five minutes to confirm, and uh, the transaction fee cost like half as much as the coffee, right? And so, tr like, there's uh, there's a reason why I um, you know like things like the Bitcoin Keats, I um, mean you know, like uh, as uh, amazing as it was in 2013, ended up uh, you know like not uh, like pr pr surviving in that decade, right? And uh, but but at the same time, like those technical problems are problems that now actually have been solved, right? Like uh, thanks to EIP fifteen fifty nine, thanks to the merge, you know, transactions actually reliably get included for me in like five to ten seconds. Like that's a real layer one UX gain that's happened only over the last three years. If you you know transaction fees on layer twos, 
thanks to blobs, which are you know, an upgrade that happened two months ago, they're now often under one cent, right? And so problems are being solved and like we actually are in a position where if we actually build things uh, targeting real world usage, then uh, you know, we actually can create things that people can uh, actually use. And uh, so I think like, we should really take advantage of uh, that opportunity and like, really get that feedback loop started. Speaking about the technology, um, mm. and this is a question I, before we wrap up, uh, this is a question I always like asking uh, Ethereum uh, core developers, but also mm. researchers. Um, with everything you know today and everything you learned in almost 10 years, um, mm. how would you build Ethereum differently today if you were able to build it from scratch again? Mm. I think, uh, yeah, I, mean, I remember I, wrote, I, even, I even wrote an article that like touched on some of these, but I definitely have a list. Like one, you know, um, okay, so one, screw the 256-bit VM, just like start with uh, 32 and 64, and then at the same time, like have some, uh, you know, like separate, maybe pre-compile, maybe other feature that uh, like lets you do bigger, in bigger integers if that's what people care about. Like the original design definitely like way overfitted the 256-bit elliptic curves. Then number two, I think probably make the EVM somewhat higher level. Like there's, uh, there's no reason why uh, it need, like the thing that we should be, uh, I, I think have is uh, we shouldn't try to, like what we should have done is we should have uh, really optimized more for allowing smart contracts to really have like fewer lines of code so that people can properly see and check what's going on inside of them. Um, three, when we switched to proof of stake, we should have been willing to switch to a, uh, a yeah, somewhat crappier version of proof of stake earlier on. Like I think we ended up wasting a lot of cycles um, on uh, really trying to make proof of stake perfect and then uh, only doing the merge in 2022. When, uh, and then it turns out that like, oh, actually, yeah, you know, like even Gaspar has a whole bunch of problems and at some point we're gonna have to um, upgrade again and do single SWAT finality. Like we could have saved a huge amount of trees if we had uh, you know, like launched simpler proof of stake in 2018. Then uh, four, um, ETH transfers should, ha should automatically issue logs. Uh, so now there's an EIP for that, 7708, but uh, you know, it should have been in there from the beginning. Like, it, had it been in there from the beginning, it could have been like 30 minutes of coding from myself, Gavin, and Jeff. And so, instead, it's an EIP, and it has to go through all core devs, and I you know like, hopefully yeah, it'll succeed at some point. Um, then, uh, let's see, yeah. What uh, other things? I mean, this all yeah, this is definitely all like very yeah, you know, low level Ethereum territory. Um, five, don't do Kachak, do SHA-256. Um, then six, um, like actually yeah, like think properly about like invariance and like basically think, I mean, like what are the worst case um, properties that you really care about? Like what are the bounds that we're trying to have? Because like even at the beginning, we really cared about trying to make Ethereum fraud provable but we somehow completely forgot about the fact that like a worst case transaction has a fraud proof whose size is like 300 megabytes. Um, so, you know, there's like a long, long list of these uh, like various uh, technical regrets. Um, though, uh, you know, I mean, I feel like uh, it's uh, inevitable for any project to like have a whole bunch of these. I mean, I think I'm just really happy that I feel like our core dev and uh, just execution capacity feels like it just keeps increasing with each passing year and we're in a position to like actually yeah, effectively yeah, and safely um, really yeah, try to uh, you know, correct for some of these uh, mistakes and like really make um, Ethereum be a platform that uh, you know, like we can really be architecturally proud of in every way. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. So before we wrap up and come to the next point on our closing ceremony agenda, mm. is you have a room full of hackers. Mm. Is there anything else you would want to share with them today? Mm. <laughs> I'm trying to think what to, what's to share, right? Because uh, like, I feel like there's a lot of really important things that I yeah, try to keep uh, you know, like mentioning and talking about, but like I'm actually becoming more and more impressed by like the speed at which some of those lessons get accepted, right? Like I, yeah, you know, like I've talked about the importance of uh, you know ZK yeah, identity and reputation primitives and like ZK voting, and there's like 
the first group that I talked to was literally doing ZK voting. I, uh, you know, talk, like I keep talking about ZooPass and uh, I mean, it's sometimes frustrating because um, like, you know, you have people who are like, oh, you know, Vitalik is pie in the sky and he's technical and he doesn't talk about applications. And then I, yeah, you know, like they, they don't even realize that ZooPass exists. Um, but uh, I mean, then, but then, you know, here it's like, oh, you know, people actually care about ZPass and, uh, you know, people actually are trying to use it and, uh, like, people are really trying to, like, build end use cases on it and, uh, you know, people don't mind that, like, ZPass does not have an associated token that can, like, make their, uh, you know, like, bags go up by 50,000%. Like, no, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's ZPass, come on. Like, it's, uh, it's doing the things that we care about and, like, let's actually use it. Um, so. I think like that kind of uh, spirit from I mean, like both the uh, organizers and the uh, hackers is uh, something that uh, really impresses me. I think uh, I mean if I had to say one thing, I think uh, one thing that I would love to see more in Ethereum is uh, like I, I want to see more diverse participation not just at like research and not just at dev, but at uh, I guess what you could call the idea layer, like the uh, the layer of like actually trying to figure, you know, like ask and answer the questions of like, you know, what is Ethereum for? What should the goals of uh, Ethereum's uh, next five hard forks be? Um, you know, like what kinds of technical trade-offs should it make? What direction should the application ecosystem um, go? You know, like how do we actually turn our current kind of like baby ZK identity ecosystem into something that actually becomes a really significant part of the world that actually helps people. How do we actually, um, you know, get Berlin to, uh, you know, like do, um, you know, like Ethereum Keats 2.0 and like actually, uh, you know, like have, uh, you know, like, like not just cash, but like actually, yeah, you know, like good uh, uh, digital cash and, uh, you know, ideally with privacy built in and like ask, uh, you know, like the questions all at the, uh, even at some of those uh, deeper layers and like, be willing to participate in uh, that in that ecosystem and like think about those things and um, you know if you have thoughts then um, you know say them and uh, ideally uh, you know like be properly cypherpunk and if you have things to say publish them on e on uh, ENS and IPFS. Oh. That was a joke, but you should actually do it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, that, thank you. Say, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Big round of applause for Vitalik. Thank you.